the priority for us at Figure is to be able to ship robots into the real world and do real useful work. Like that's what really matters at the end of the day. So um, in order to do that, we clearly have to design a product, like a robotic solution product that works really well. And we, we need a customer. Uh, we need to be able to ship robots into uh, real companies that can do real useful work. So having BMW here is for us um, a part of the puzzle. It's now complete on being able to actually ship robots into real life. And we hope to do that, you know, at the earliest this year um, and ship into uh, BMW Spartansburg, South Carolina uh, plants, uh, which is what happens to be like what they're basically um, the facility that does like basically the, like the most uh, cars produced per year than any other facility globally for them. And, and they have on, on the ground there, like uh, one of the best robotics teams I've, I've seen. Um, and the, the, that team uh, is basically spearheading basically the integration and deployment of our humanoid robots into that Spartansburg facility. Um, and I, I think we all, we ultimately like basically turned down every major car group uh, to do this. So there you go. I mean, it's not as if they had a shortage of customers or clients. You know, um, <laughs> just. Amazing! It's just it's just so amazing that as a son that as you rightly put it, it's just it's not within the realm of possibility. It's real, and I don't think uh, there are very many CEOs, at least of these um, top uh, Fortune 100 companies in the auto sector, or manufacturing, or in warehousing, um, that can afford to ignore humanoid bots um, anymore. Scott, let me just ask you this: what what is this? tell you about the choice of partner that figure has chosen, um, BMW. Why BMW? Um, what does it tell you about the relationship that figure would have with BMW? And what does it tell you about what they're going to do when it comes to deploying these bots on the factory floor? Okay, so th the first thing, of course, is he's really talking about the, the end goal at some point, realizing that we really want to be able to to scale them to be used anywhere, but you just can't get there right away. You, you have to look at the the waypoints along there and the realizing that the first thing you have to do is look at sort of the easier environments that are far more controlled. And a factory is a really well-controlled environment. And also it's where you can get um, most bang for the buck. So, so you can start to get the revenue streams that would allow you to be able to scale up. Now, when you're picking a partner, and I've seen this as, as a startup as well, it's about anyone that's running a company will tell you, that sometimes you pick the wrong customer and they just turn out to be a disaster because they either don't have the skill set or they're very difficult to work with. So you need to be very careful to, to find someone that really, really wants to work with you and then has a proper skill set. So it was really nice that they, they had the opportunity to talk to all of them and see that, oh, yes, there seems to be a really good matchup here as far as their technical capability and probably also the plant. Now, the plant, I think, is about 30 years old, which a lot of people might think, well, that's a pretty old plant. But the reality is it's not. A lot of plants are a lot older than that. And in the meantime, they have been automating and scaling it up. And it's the uh, most productive plant of all the BMW plants. And, and that happens probably because it's really been well designed, really well automated. And it, it seems like it might be that this is almost like a plug and play kind of situation that they can go in there very easily. Whereas if sometimes they go into a lot of other plants that maybe are a little bit older, it might be more like 50 years old or something. You might find that's much harder to deploy in there. The other thing, which is very, very important, he said, we need a customer. Absolutely agree. You, you can build these bots and you can do great demonstrations in a lab. But at some point, you have to demonstrate it in the real world. You need real world data. And you can try to create as much as you want in your own setting. But the reality is the best thing is to have a customer. You need that feedback. Uh, and so that, that's why I say when, when I look at the pathway that he's proposing everything, it just makes general sense to me. And they've already done a lot of the initial prep work. They've identified the actual areas they can go into, the tasks that they believe they can start to automate already. And they're working ferociously right now to try to get the bot ready, to get their ability to train the bots uh, going. They're doing simulations already because they already have a lot of the CAD and product data in there that they can start to put in their sims so that when they start to scale this up and get it out to the plant, they will start to expect right. to start seeing results. So I, I think it is quite feasible. And uh, you know, when I heard that, you know, everything in there just made absolute sense for me. Hmm. Yeah. 
But I think it's, just... it's it... go on. Yeah. Sorry. I was just gonna go say I was just gonna add that I think it's no coincidence that the first announced partner is an automobile company. Figures and main is... competition right now is Tesla. It's, Tesla yeah. right now drives most mm -hmm. of the revenue from automobiles. Mm -hmm. And if you're gonna fire a shot across the bow of your competition, then partner right. with one of their competitors. Yeah. And so BMW would be the optimal, the number one partner. I don't know necessarily from our perspective if we can determine that. Certainly from Figure's perspective, that's that was their determination. But I guess yes. as, and I think that as, as Brett said, their robotics team was perhaps the most clued in into this yes. partnership. And so it was the right fit. Yes, it, it, it has to be the right fit. So they probably looked at it. Um, you know, th there's a chance some of the automotive OEMs they were talking to may have felt more like tire kickers. They're coming by looking at trying to understand it, but it wasn't really clear that they had a vision or were able to show that they're really buying into the into the concept. And there may have been others that did deliberately seem eager and really want to do it, but you might say their plant isn't quite right or they don't seem to maybe have quite the expertise or we're not confident in the robotics group or or maybe the management team. You're just not really convinced that they're behind it because sometimes you'll have some middle managers that are behind it. You get everything going, yeah. but the, the upper management. Yeah. So I'm sure they had to vet it out. Look at all that. I do agree with CERN. It's kind of a clever move because, you know, Brett said they're going to bring on one more other um, client. It's going to be non-automotive yes. and that's yes. it until they're able to get up there. And that's a sign of a mature company to, to know when to say no. But the problem is when you're saying no, you're like leaving this whole marketplace open mm -hmm. and you're thinking like, I'm giving it over to my competition. So let's say they didn't go into automotive and Tesla starts doing it in their automotive plants and then it starts trickling down into their supplier network. Okay. Now the other suppliers are going to want the same thing. They're going to start coming to Tesla and saying, hey, can we get it? Even though we don't supply you, we're supplying you know, Ford and, and GM and Stellantis and others, Tesla might say, okay, sure, you, you can go ahead and do it. And then you might start getting the automotive OEMs finally saying, buckling under saying, we'll go to Tesla and ask for it as well. And then what you've done is you've seeded the entire automotive industry to Tesla at that point. So it is kind of a brilliant blocking move in a sense. That's like by doing this stake in the ground, and all the other automotive companies are going to probably be cheering, let's say, more for figure at this point, because they realize, okay, if if this this humanoid bot thing turns out, we don't have to buy it from our, our direct competitor. We can buy it from someone else. So right. yeah, if, if you look at it from that standpoint, I think it's a very good move on the part of figure. Right. The other so, thing too, Royden, is is yeah. that figure needs to, at some point, determine how they're going to manufacture these bots at scale. And mm. figure doesn't have the, that capability. So why not yeah. partner with a company that potentially can offer that to them at some point too? So I think this is both kind of an offensive and defensive move on their part. 